text for this morning is found in the very first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It is prior to the birth of Jesus. It tells us perhaps more than any other passage something about Mary, the mother of our Lord. I suspect that outside of Jesus himself, the most well-known personality in the Christmas story at the nativity scene as part of the Christmas narrative is Christ's mother, Mary. And while some people through the ages have gone too far perhaps in their veneration of Mary, almost sometimes to the point of putting her in the category of deity, there is much for us, so much for us to learn from this young woman, a human being, just like us, who found favor with God in that vein. Hear these words this morning from Luke chapter one. I'm gonna be reading from the J.B. Phillips translation. Then six months after Zachariah's vision, he was, you recall, to be the father of John the Baptist. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a Galilean town, Nazareth by name, to a young woman who was engaged to a man called Joseph. Remember, as we emphasized last week, that in that culture there were three phases of a marriage. There was the announcement that the family of both parties would agree on, they would gather, yes, Joseph will marry Mary, Mary will marry Joseph. Then there would actually be a, a more public announcement where many, many people would be invited. It was a type of celebration. This was the betrothal. We would know it as the engagement. It was such importance that to get out of the engagement, you couldn't just give out the, give back the engagement ring, you, you had to get a divorce. You, you were, as we might say, permanently hitched at that point. You weren't living together as husband and wife, but you were betrothed, you were engaged. And then there would be the actual wedding day, the time of celebration, when a man and woman would start to live together as husband and wife. So the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a Galilean town, Nazareth by name, to a young woman who was engaged, betrothed to a man called Joseph. The girl's name was Mary. The angel Gabriel entered her room and said, Greetings to you, Mary, O favored one. The Lord be with you. Now Mary was deeply perturbed at these words, and you can imagine if you were encountered by an angel. We don't know if this was through a dream or through a vision or how the encounter happened. We just know what happened. And Mary was deeply perturbed at these words and wondered what such a greeting could possibly mean. But the angel said to her, you hear these words so often in Holy Scripture, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary. God loves you dearly. And we could preach a whole sermon just on that this morning. Don't be afraid, people. God loves you dearly. Don't be afraid, Mary. God loves you dearly. You are going to be the mother of a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be known as the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his forefather David, and he will be king over the people of Jacob forever. His reign, Mary, shall never end. But then Mary, the young woman spoke to the angel how can this be she said i'm not married betrothed but not married had not lived with joseph as husband and wife but the angel made this reply to her the holy spirit will come upon you the power of the most high will overshadow you your child will therefore be called holy the son of god your cousin elizabeth has also conceived a son old as she is indeed this is the sixth month for her a woman who was called barren 
for no promise of God can fail to be fulfilled. Here's Mary's reply. I belong to the Lord, body and soul. Let it happen as you say. And at this, the angel left her. Can you imagine Mary's situation for just a few moments this morning? She is a young woman, perhaps as young as 13, 14, or 15 years old. That is when young ladies in that culture would be betrothed to their husbands. Marriage took place early. So she is a young woman, and she is so excited because her parents and Joseph's parents have arranged for them to be betrothed and then to be married. Do you remember how it was when you became engaged? She is so, so excited. And plans are being made. And it doesn't matter to Mary that they're not going to have very much. Joseph was a pretty well-known carpenter. They would have a modest living, but they were in love and they loved God. And this was a marriage made in heaven. And yet in the middle of that betrothal period. Can you imagine this? She is encountered by Gabriel, God's angel, and she's told two things. First of all, he says, Mary, you are going to be the mother of the Messiah. You're going to be the mother of the Son of God himself. And you can imagine how perplexed she was, confused she was, but at the same time grateful she was that God had chosen her, a lowly, peasant, very poor, young woman from Nazareth of all places, to be the mother of the Messiah. But she is still contemplating this in her mind, and she asks the question, well, how how can this happen? Joseph and I are betrothed. We are not married. We can't have children yet. She's thinking of something on down the line. And then she is told the second thing, that there will not be another human being in this encounter. It will be Mary and then the Holy Spirit will, as the King James says, come upon her and she will conceive and carry a son and his name will be Jesus. Can can you imagine how you would feel? But I want you to hold on to that for just a, a few moments as we look at at least two truths or matters that we need to derive from this Christmas story that the story of Mary can teach us and hopefully help us. The first thing that this encounter that Mary has with Gabriel tells us is that she had found favor with God. Have any of you all ever been somebody's favorite? Favorite child? Teacher's pet? favorite of your teacher, perhaps the favorite player on your coach's basketball team, the favorite, the favorite grandchild, just the favorite. Do you you know how it feels to be the favorite? I do. It started from the time that I was born. (laughs) And let me tell you how it happened. My grandfather, Calvin Long, had three children, all girls. He was a farmer. He was a supervisor, Sunset Memorial Gardens. He was a hard worker. And he loved his daughters dearly. But I think Maybe, just maybe, in the back of a mind, he, you know, it'd been okay if he'd had a son. 
Guess who was the first grandchild that came along? Moi. And he was so excited that this boy had come into the family life that I could do no wrong. I did lots of wrong. But my grandparents never saw that wrong. Even if they did, well, it must be somebody else's fault. I mean, I was the favorite child. They loved all their grandchildren, but they really loved me. I I think I was the favorite son. As my mother says, she still introduces me to everybody at Lexington Country Place. He's my favorite son. Yes, mother, I'm your only son. Well, yeah, you're you're my favorite son. And uh, she would spoil me pretty royally growing up. Uh, I could come in, even when I'm in high school, it didn't matter what time it was, it could be 10 o'clock at night. Mom, I would like a fried egg sandwich with mayonnaise and toast. I got it. It could be midnight, this is no joke. Mom, I think I need a cup of coffee. Here it is. There were times, you can't believe this, that I would put off writing a paper and I would get it written and that was before the days of, uh, you know, computers and laptops and I had written it out longhand. That's how I did things forever. And Mom, I need this typed, due tomorrow. She would stay up half the night or beyond and do that. I was royally spoiled by my grandparents, by my dad, especially by my mom and even by my two sisters. That's just the way it was. I was, I know what it means to be the favorite. Well, Deborah and I fell in love. And we got married. You could finish the illustration. (laughs) (laughs) But we got married and, and we were already close friends and known each other since we were 12 years old. Got married when we were 20. We were in love big time. We were living in married student housing at Georgetown College. It was called Warrendale. They were old World War II Army barracks that they had moved in. We called them cardboard estates, but we didn't care. You know, we were big time in love. So we're sitting in Warrendale in kind of our honeymoon cottage. We've been married about four weeks and we're watching TV, this little black and white that sometimes would get two or three channels. And I said, Deborah, I'd like a cup of spiced tea. Nonchalantly, she said, there's the kitchen in there. Go in there and fix one for yourself and bring me one too. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be different. (laughs) But I knew deep in my heart that I was her favorite. She picked me when I asked her. God, she said, yes. And I was her favorite and she was my favorite, but what we figured out, and to be quite honest, we're still figuring out, is that to have a good marriage and to be favorites to one another, it's a collaborative process. It's a partnership venture. Thanks for the partnership. Mary found favor with God God could have chosen someone else, maybe someone from the holy city in Jerusalem, maybe someone from the royal family, but no, he chose a poor peasant girl, 13, 14, 15 years old, from Nazareth of all places, who was betrothed to Joseph, who was way, 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 way back a descendant of David. And the Messiah was to come from the house of David. So she was the favored one. She found out very quickly that to be favored didn't mean that life for her was always going to be easy, pain-free. Because one of the first things that happened when the people in Nazareth found out that she was pregnant is the gossip started wait a minute they're not married yet we don't even know if joseph's the father how could she that little no good loose living vamp you can you hear all the tongues wagging up there in nazareth so she had that 
And then there was that journey when she was almost ready to deliver, eight and three-fourths months, maybe almost nine months pregnant, and because of this census, Joseph, who was from Bethlehem, took off for Bethlehem. It was 70 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And I've often wondered, why didn't he just leave her back there? You ever wondered that? You know why? He wanted to escape the wagging tongues of Nazareth. He knew as bad as it was when he was there, if he left, boy, she was really going to catch it. And so he, being a just man, took her with him. She gave birth in Bethlehem. And incidentally, she didn't have to go. She wasn't from Bethlehem, not her family. They were, they were just northerners from Nazareth. But she went because Joseph didn't want her to be the target of all that criticism. But they got to Bethlehem, and she gave birth to our Savior, to Jesus. It was not in the confines, certainly, of a hospital. It wasn't even in the confines of of her room back home it was in a in a stable most of the time when women of that day and age gave birth their mothers would be there and jewish midwives would be there but in making that journey and getting away from the criticism she gave up all of that do you think it's easy to be favored that sometimes there's pain and suffering that go along with it and sacrifice. Joseph is there, some livestock's there. She gives birth to her firstborn son, our Savior Christ Jesus. To be favored is exciting, but to be favored can sometimes be difficult and challenging. And even later, she had to watch as her son Jesus grew up. Not everybody understood him. Perhaps we think she raised him by herself. The last mention we have of Joseph, the surrogate earthly father, is when he and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem at age 12. We don't hear much about Joseph after that. Scholars speculate that Mary was a, a widow early on in her life. She's raising this child. He's a teenager. He probably goes to the carpenter shop and he learns the trade. And then he, he leaves that family business and he goes off on an itinerant journey to preach. Well, that hurt because he left home. Can you imagine that? Those of you who have put students on the way to college, sure. It's a little sad there. But what really made her sad is some people followed him and were excited about his miracles and his teaching. Some people, almost from the very beginning, criticized him. To the extent that before it was over, they criticized him to such a degree that they plotted to take his life, and they did. Can you imagine your child being tortured? falsely accused of being a traitor to the government, nailed to a cross. You're watching there, and he dies. Just remember that to be favored is a privilege. Do you know how favored we are, church? Do you know how blessed we are? But even as we celebrate that, we've got to remember that sometimes that calls for some sacrifice on our part. I want, to be, I want to be a member of the church. I want my name on the church row. I even want my picture in the directory. And I'm going to come every now and then, but not too often. And when I come, I don't want to stay very long. I, this isn't you all. I'm talking about this other church down here. And, you know... What's a crazy preacher talking about? Two offerings. I mean, good Lord. To be favored is privilege. We, we get to go to heaven, folks. 
It's guaranteed if you know Christ as your Savior, sins are forgiven. That's where we're headed. But in the meantime, God would like us to collaborate with him, to partner with him, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people so that they could be in heaven too. That's the first lesson for Mary, to be favored. Well, there's a second one, and it's basically this. That story teaches us what it really means to trust and obey. Do you know Mary didn't have to say yes? God never forced her. He never forces any of us, really. There is this part of parliamentary procedure which is known as making a motion. And if you are in a business meeting or in a congregation, the meeting's been called to order, you can say, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moderator, I move that we do such and such. But in order for that to be discussed and eventually perhaps to even be actuated, somebody's got to second the motion. And if you get a second and it's brought to the group and you can discuss it and amend it and figure out, yeah, this is what we're being called to do, that's wonderful. But have you ever been in a meeting, and I certainly have, where the motion dies for lack of a second? God brings lots of motions into this world, ladies and gentlemen. The motion of what it means to be the church, the motion of what it means to care for the homeless, the motion of what it means to give a, an extra offering for the Christmas project, a motion for the church to go to Haiti, a motion for the church to have a viable college ministry. He's making all kinds of motions. Would we dare to second the motion? Would it ever die for lack of a second I like the story of the little girl she and her mother are upstairs in their house and the mom says to the little girl where are your shoes and she says well they're downstairs in the kitchen well what are they doing down there nothing because they don't have any feet in them to help them walk. I think sometimes God looks down upon us and he says, uh, church, about your talents and your gifts, well, where are they? Well, they're kind of downstairs. What are they doing? Well, nothing right now. And God says, do you think that maybe you need to be the feet to help them walk and we collaborate with God? And it happens. So much to be learned from Mary's story. May we as a church celebrate the fact that we are favored. We know the gospel. We know Christ as our Savior, the way to eternal life. And in knowing that, May we be willing to be God's messengers and to share it with others. Well, anytime I go to a basketball game at Rupp Arena, I'm, I'm thinking about one particular game that happened long, long ago when I first came to this church. And Deborah and I had gone to the game, and unlike yesterday, the Cats had won this game, but that's another story. But it was one of the best games that I'd ever seen. And so we came and we hurried because, you know, the next day was Sunday, and to be quite honest, I still needed to do a few things on my sermon to get ready so that I could put some finishing touches on the message I thought I was supposed to preach. And Most of the time, we would park out in the upper parking lot or something, but for whatever reason, uh, this particular day, we, we parked between the buildings right here on Rhodes Avenue. And so we rushed back. We jumped in the car because we wanted to beat the ball game traffic out of town because remember I still need to put some finishing touches on the sermon and 
I thought, I've got to run back in real quick. There was some material, a, a book or something I needed to put those finishing touches on. And I ran back into the side door and there they were. There was a couple there. And at first I thought they were just security guards. I really did because they had coats on and said, Johnson Security. Okay. But they said, are you the pastor? Yes. Well, we've been waiting for you. My wife is two months pregnant. We just started working last week for Johnson Security. We won't get paid for five more days. Any way you could help us out? And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I need to get home and finish the sermon. But then I said, well, he said, well, let me tell you, um, we've got this job. We just need help for a couple of days. And my name is William. And my wife's name is Noel. And it's close to Christmas. And can you help us out? And I did because of your generosity. We had money in the benevolence fund. And we found them a room that night Got them something good to eat, breakfast the next morning, shelter, a nice bed to sleep in. But I thought as Deborah and I drove home after helping this couple that I almost got close to not seconding the motion. Listen. Listen. You are going to encounter this holiday season lots of Marys and Josephs and Williams and Noels. And you can't do everything. You can't solve all of their problems. But God will place motions before you and people before you and mission activities before you. May we always second the motion.